God for that. Amen. Well, I'm actually going to do something that may surprise you. I'm going to pick up where I left off on the series uh, a long time ago. And uh, that was, we, we looked at walking toward the tomb, and then we be went beyond the tomb. And we, were, uh, we first studied the uh, covenants of the Lord, that God always keeps His promise. Amen? I'm so glad that we don't have a, a God or serve a God that lies and doesn't keep His promises. He keeps His promises. And one of those promises are to Israel, and He will keep that promise. Brother Kelly covered that a little in his uh, message today. And we will be overlapping, he and I, today, not that we planned it that way. He should have really by rights taught that Wednesday, but God put it together that we would do this, and so uh, I always enjoy that when God puts uh, those two together. And so what we want to do now, we, had, we covered, we started in the feast days, and we find also that God keeps His promises. And uh, people say there are no perfect types. Uh, that, that is true somewhat, but when God used the feast days as, as uh, examples and types of Christ, he, he was spot on exact with those. So in other words, when Christ died, He died exactly on the Passover. And the types all point to Him. And so we see that truth. Then, then when He was buried, He was buried on the, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then when He rose again, He rose on the Feast of First Fruits. And so God kept those intact. And, so, and, and throughout the feast days, we'll see that He keeps those intact. And the four that we know about, he kept intact. So why would he not do the others? So he will. And so we know that, that truth. And I have been so excited about studying this one. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Have you ever studied something that you hesitated on getting into it? And then once you got into it, you didn't want to stop. Uh, that's what this has been for me. I, I didn't know how to approach it. And so I just prayed a long time and asked God how to approach it. I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect, but I feel like this is what God would have me to bring today. And I think it just, it excited me, especially when I finished it. Um, it really excited me that God has put this all together. We're going to be in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. And we'll be going all over the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, to show you these truths uh, in, in both of those. Um, and so Leviticus chapter 23, there, there is a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is a dispensational difference. We'll see that. But they agree. They always agree. They, they work together. And so we find truths in the Old Testament that came to light in the New Testament. This is such one of those things. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. The Bible says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of uh, the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, what he's talking about is the Feast of first fruits has already been completed. Now, after the Sabbath, one day after the Sabbath, there is to be counted 50 days, which is seven weeks. Seven weeks is 49 days, and then one more day would be 50. So, he said, count the 50 days. Uh, even unto the morrow after the Sabbath, uh, uh, after the seventh Sabbath shall be number 50 days. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your uh, habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year. And one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offerings and uh, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year of a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord, with the two lambs 
and uh, with the two lambs they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute uh, forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Uh, and when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave uh, uh, them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So what we want to talk about today is the Feast of uh, Pentecost. Pentecost just means 50 days. That's exactly what it means. There's no uh, uh, secret uh, meaning there. And, and, and I, want to, I want to show you, first of all, there's a great truth found here in Leviticus chapter 23. And it shows you how God uh, uh, puts things together. Number one, He shows us a division, a clear division. There is a phrase that He uses in, in all of, of uh, Leviticus chapter 23 that shows us distinct divisions. Look in verse 1 of chapter 23. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, now that is found uh, other places, and we're going to look at that, that phrase. He spake unto, the Lord, uh, unto Moses, saying, the Lord did. Okay, now in this first section is verses 1 through 8. Now, they are before they enter into the land, that promised land. This is before they entered into the promised land. Verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto, the, unto Moses, saying, and then he covers in verses 1 through 3, the Sabbath. He covers that Sabbath of rest. That is that day where, Saturday, where the law, this is part of the law that was given, okay? And so the, the Israel was to practice that Sabbath day. Now that's not a feast day, that is just a Sabbath day. He covers that, it's important. Because the Jews worshipped on, rested and worshipped on Saturday, okay? Now, then we find in verses 4 through 5, we find the Feast of Passover, which points to and pictures the death of Christ. Okay? We covered that, how that Christ died on the Passover. That's covered in verses 4 through 5. Then we find the Feast of Unleavened Bread covered in verses 6 through 8, which points to and pictures the burial of Christ. And we've covered all that, so I'm not going to go over that in detail. But you see that in that section where he said, he said unto the Lord, uh, or he said unto Moses. Um, then we find, look in verse 9. There it is again. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, this is the second section. This is the longest section. And then we find that this is after they entered into the land. Okay? They, we find this truth. Then he says in verses 9 through 14, the feast of first fruits. Notice uh, verse 11. And he shall wave the sheaf uh, before the Lord to be uh, accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. On the morrow after the Sabbath. What is the day after Saturday? Sunday, the first day of the week. Okay, so there's something new happening here. Okay, uh, uh, and, and so he said he will wave it there. Before the resurrection, it was Saturday, the Sabbath. After the resurrection, it is Sunday, the first day of the week. We are not told in the New Testament to practice the Sabbath. The Sabbath went away with the law. Okay? And so we see that clearly. Even in the Old Testament, we see that truth. The resurrection was on Sunday, the first day of the week. At the resurrection of Christ, there is a new dispensation. There's a new dispensation. Brother Kelly is covering that. The word new is important because this is a new dispensation. What is that dispensation? Some people call it the dispensation of grace. And I'm like Kelly, I don't like to use that because God practiced grace throughout the Bible. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so grace has always been there. It's the church age. It's the age of God's body, the body of Christ, and heavenly people, the church age. And so God has shown us that truth even in the Old Testament. We see that truth even more as we go through. And so up until then, uh, there's an earthly order, 
of things. God has got an earthly order. That's the Jewish people. That law was given to an earthly people, and they will always be an earthly people. Never be a heavenly people. They'll always be earthly. But then God has given us a new heavenly people, which is the church, those of us who are born again, okay? Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's that earthly religion. After the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, earthly religion, and not after Christ. Okay? Christ brought forth a heavenly people. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where, uh, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Uh, when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then, uh, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, there's a new order of things. God is setting a new order. Even in the Old Testament, he's setting a, there's some new things that are going to show up here that you'll see as we go through it. Uh, and, and so because that, uh, that new thing, that new order, is based on the completed redemptive work of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, the new work has begun and the past has been blotted out. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so, thank God that he blots out our, our past. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins, uh, and the uncircumcision uh, of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Okay? You have become a new creature. There's a new dispensation. We don't live by the law. We can't keep the law. They couldn't keep the law. And so we're looking at this age of the church. Now, note that up until, up until this changing, everything was dated from the Passover. The Passover was a certain day of the week. And then the unleavened bread started a certain day of the week. And the first fruit started a, a certain day of the week. And those first three are the springtime uh, feast that God put forward. And that was before the resurrection. Okay? And so we see that truth. Now look in verse 15. In verse, in, from verse 15 down through verse 22, we find the Feast of Pentecost. This feast, which is also called the Feast of Weeks, it's also called the Feast of the Harvest. It's called uh, the Feast of Weeks because it was seven Sabbaths, seven weeks, which is 49. One more the day after that makes it 50 days. And so we see it called the Feast of Weeks. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 23, look in verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer, look at this, a new meat offering unto the Lord. Something new is about to happen. It's not the same kind of offering that's been offered before. And I'll show you that truth here in a few minutes. This is a dispensational truth in the Old Testament. This is showing us that there's going to be a changing, okay? And there was a change. God changed the dispensations after Christ resurrected, okay? So, first fruits is resurrection, the Feast of Pentecost is the 50 days after that. Praise God uh, for a church that takes time to teach you dispensational truths. Are you glad for that? I'm glad for that. I didn't understand dispensational truths when I first got saved. I still, I can't say I understand absolutely 100%. I don't think Kelly can say that of everything that's in there. But we get a good idea from the Bible what he's talking about. And so thank God for a, a church that takes time to teach us those things that we might learn them and know those things, and it helps us to live within our dispensation. Uh, one preacher said this, um, if you'll get your head wrapped around the first century Bible truth, you won't have your head wrapped around 21st uh, century error. Amen? Isn't that a good statement? That's a good statement. And so if we know where we came from, we know where we're going, and we know how to live where we are. So we won't be trying to keep the the stinking, can't eat catfish and you can't do this. You know, it's silly. I know a, a New Testament preacher taught his people that they couldn't eat catfish because of the dietary laws. 
How stupid. That's not in the scripture. And so dispensational truth. The dispensations are important. Brother Kelly is covering it very good. Very detailed. And so we ought to record those. We ought to uh, capture those recordings and, um, and get that and study those things. So this new dispensation that we're talking about is not Israel revamped or improved. This new dispensation that we live in is the, the body of Christ. It's the church age. It's a time when, when, when Christ is gathering a people for himself. Amen? And, th and that's what it is. Clearly, there are people that teach that the church is just Israel. Spiritual Israel. False. That is very false. Israel's still here, by the way. Israel's still going to be dealt with, by the way. Israel's still going to be God's people one day. Uh, in, in, the new, um, in the new millennial reign, they will be God's people again. And he's, he's not forgot about Israel. Okay, now this is also called, as I said in the scripture, the Feast of Weeks. <coughs> and, the, and the Feast of the Harvest. And it was at the end of the wheat harvest and the barley harvest. That's in, important because this is part of the harvest. What we're living now is part of, the, of God's harvest. Okay, it is, uh, is the gathering up of a people and we are the first fruits of that harvest. Harvest, and we're going to see that a little later in this in this portion. Okay, now there could never have been a feast of Pentecost had there not been a feast of the of the first fruits. Had Christ not resurrected, there would be no church. Amen. Christ had to rise from the dead and ascend into heaven and take the throne for us to be a church. Okay, and so I want you to see that without the harvest. There could have never been a loaf. Amen. You don't gather in the wheat and the barley. There can be nothing made of it. And so Christ had to resurrect. He is the first fruits of that. He had to sit down on the right hand of the Father. He had to offer His blood for us. And so this truth is found in the Feast of Pentecost. Had Christ never resurrected, there could never have been a church. Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to turn there if you would. Ephesians chapter 1. There'll be places here where me and Brother Kelly uh, overlap a little, but it won't hurt us. Amen? And I don't know that I covered it any better than he did. I'm, I don't intend to, but I want to show you this truth. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? Who is that? That's the church. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. You see that? There, there had, that had to happen first. For, far above all principality and power and might and dominion that, and, and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. How can there be a body without a head? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had this ask you, when did the church start? Church could not have started without a head. Christ had to resurrect and sit down at the right hand of the throne of God before there could be a church. It's clearly said right here in the scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that, okay? After he sat down at the right hand of God, his church is the body of Christ. That happened at the day of Pentecost, amen? That happened at the day of Pentecost. It's very clear. We don't have to guess, amen? Now, you can play games if you want to and guess around and say this and that, but the truth is the truth, and there it is, okay? Now, I'm not going to argue with somebody if they won't believe something different, and I have friends that believe other things different. But I believe that it started at the day of Pentecost because Scripture upon Scripture. Uh, you can't have a body without a head. So when did it happen? It had to happen after the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Uh, the, the church could not have been started before the day of Pentecost because the head had to be set. Okay? The Scripture emphatically tells us that Christ had to die, be buried, and risen from the dead and be glorified before his spirit could come down. He told us that. He had to go away before the spirit could come. 
He had to be set as the head before the Spirit of God could come down and dwell the church. And so without the indwelling of the Spirit, there is no church. And so the church had to start on the day of Pentecost. Amen? Amen. And there's so many uh, uh, things in this Old Testament truth that point uh, that this thing is supernaturally written. We don't have a book that's written by men. There's no man wise enough or smart enough to put all these things together that God put together that you can see this there and that there and this here and that there and it all comes together. That's because the Holy Spirit, it's inspired, uh, given to men to write these wonderful truths. Now, notice the difference. Look in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 17. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. And they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now I want to show you some things right here. This is found in the Old Testament. This is found in Leviticus chapter 23. But it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Okay? So we're going to see those truths. Number one, all the other, all the other offerings... Uh, the the uh, Passover uh, and the unleavened bread and the uh, first fruits they came from the flock or the field. This one came from their house. He said, "Go into your habitation and bring forth these things." Okay, and that house speaks of is a picture of man in his body. Okay. We, this, this has to do with man. This has to do with God doing something for man in this offering. Number one, there was uh, fine flour. This speaks of Christ. Fine flour. There's nothing harsh or rough or, or, or bad in it. It's smooth. You can take fine flour and rub it between your hands and you won't feel anything. It's just, it's just smooth. Okay, it's a smooth, one of the smoothest things there is. And that's Christ. He had no sin. Okay, he was sinless. But man is sinful. The Bible says all sin comes short of the glory of God. And so we're sinful. But Christ is not sinful. And so there's a, there is a mixing of two. Then there was two loaves. Two loaves. Brother Kelly talked about this. Who are those two loaves? Both Jew and Gentile. The, the scriptures, look in Ephesians chapter 2. I'll show you that truth. Ephesians chapter 2, look in verse number 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now we know that we Gentiles are the uncircumcision. The circumcision is the Jews. Okay? And they call us the uncircumcision. And that's what the Bible says here. Now, it goes on to say uh, that at, the, at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But look, look at the next verse. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one. How did Christ make two loaves into one loaf? Through the body of Christ. Now, the nation of Israel is not saved. That, that day is coming. The, the tribulation period will melt them back into seeing that Christ is the Savior. But individual Jewish people can be saved. Amen? People don't go to heaven because they're Jewish. No more than Daniel gets to go to heaven because his mom and dad goes to church here. Israel's not saved because they're Jewish. They must be born again. But every Jew that is saved becomes a member of the church a part of the body of Christ. Amen? Uh, a member of the body of Christ, what I meant to say. And so they become, so those two, Jew and Gentile, come together. Let's read the rest of it. And I've broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now we know that in Israel, Brother Kelly's been there, there is that middle wall where the Gentiles are on one side, the Jews are on the other, the Gentiles can't go in there. But the Bible says he broke that down. How did he break it down? Through Christ. He came to save all people. Everyone, okay? Jew and Gentile alike. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments continued in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man or loaf. So making peace, 
uh, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which are far off, and to them, not only did he preach to us, he preached to them, preached to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit, by one spirit unto the Father. There's another truth that the church started after he resurrected and after he ascended and the Holy Spirit came down. Amen? By the Spirit are we made one. You can't be saved without the Holy Spirit uh, drawing you to Him. And then once you are drawn to Him and you trust Him by faith, uh, after repenting and trusting Christ by faith, then you are made part of the body of Christ, whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile. Does that make sense? The two loaves were offered. Now, there were three moves made in the book of Acts. Very quickly, right on. Number one, Christ had to go up. He ascended in chapter 1. Is that right? The Holy Spirit had to come down. He said, I'll send you another comforter. He couldn't do that until he was gone. Now, the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. And then the church went out. Okay? And we're still going out. We're evangelizing those who are lost and telling them about Christ. That had to happen after Pentecost. In fact, it did happen after Pentecost. You read nowhere in the, in the, in the four Gospels where 3,000 people got saved. It only happened after Pentecost. And so the church started after Pentecost, okay? Then I noticed this. I, I had never thought of this. Never had thought of this at all. But I, I got studying and I looked it up. And I even called my wife in there because she knows about these things. Notice that it says it was baked with leaven. With leaven. Now, let me give you a truth. Exodus chapter 24, uh, 34, verse 25. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Before this feast, he said no leaven. No leaven is to be in anything. In fact, they were to sweep it out with a feather and go burn it in a fire. I mean, they, it was a big deal to have the leaven out of the house. So this offering from, from Leviticus 23 is a meal offering or a meat offering. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 11, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. This further shows us this is a new thing. Okay? He says this. Is, is God contradicting himself here? Did, did he say no leaven and then all of a sudden he says leaven and contradicts? No, it's something new. He's showing them something new after the resurrection, okay? And what this pictures is, uh, everything before this day pictures Christ, which is sinless. So there can't be leaven. After this, he's showing us that he's bringing man to Christ and perfecting him through Christ in the Holy Spirit, okay? And so he shows us this thing. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the Sabbath, uh, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. This is a new meat offering, okay? New, sinful man, leaven. Um, uh, the sinful man can be righteous when he has Christ in him, okay? When he has Christ in him. Notice that all prior feasts have, uh, have all the elements but two. Number one, they have no sin, no leaven. And number two, they have no sin offering. None of the other offerings had a sin offering. This is for man. This is showing us that it's for man. Now, leaven. Let's look at leaven just a minute. The Bible says this. It's a type shown in the Bible as a type of sin. Okay? Uh, and that's why they're to get it out. Uh, and, and there's something very interested, interesting in this. It says that it is bacon. I don't know how much you know about this leaven, but I had to ask my wife to come in here, and I asked her this question. When does leaven or yeast cause the bread to rise? You put it in there, and you put it out, and time, it rises before you put it in the oven. You know what the oven does to it? It arrests, I looked it up, it arrests the leaven, stops the leaven. So leaven is present, but it's been arrested. 
Okay, it's been stopped. Now what happens to the believer when he gets saved? And the Holy Spirit dwells in him. What happens to the church? Uh, do they have sin? Of course. But it should be arrested. It should be, it should be that the Holy Spirit is arresting that sin as it comes up. He, he, he takes us and shows us that that is wrong and it's not right. And sin shouldn't progress in our lives. Can it? Sure it can. But should it? No. Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. We're not righteous of our own, uh, our own being. We're righteous because Christ is in us. Okay? And the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so I thought that was interesting that it's baked. There's been a glorious change in me since I was saved. I still have this old body. This old body still wants to sin. The flesh wants to sin. But I have something in me that arrests that sin and puts it in its rightful place. Does that make sense? Now, notice in verse 17. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour and they shall be bacon with leaven. They are first fruits unto the Lord. Now, what does the Bible call Christ? The first fruit. He brought, he brought His blood and put it uh, on the mercy seat. But did you know the Bible also calls us the first fruits? We are the first fruits of the harvest. This is not the end of the harvest. James chapter 1 verse 18. Of His own will begat He us with the Lord, with the word of truth, that we would be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. We are the first fruits of the harvest. Those of us who are saved are the first fruits. We'll, step, uh, we'll go to heaven when, uh, when we die, and we'll also be resurrected up in the, in the rapture of the church, which Brother Kelly is going to cover. Acts chapter 15, verse 14. Simeon hath declared now uh, how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, a first fruits. Okay? This is the first fruit of the harvest. I got news for you. The Bible tells us many places that He will rapture us out of here. There's coming a time when we'll get to go be with Him. Then what happens is the, the, the harvest continues with the Jews in the tribulation period. We're going to cover that. Brother Kelly will cover it, and I'll cover it too. And so in that tribulation period, there, there is a harvesting that takes place, goes through the... Uh, the judgment of nations, and there will be a people that is re preserved and reserved over into the millennial reign. And uh, that, that doesn't mean the harvest is over. There will be people saved in the millennial reign that will honestly go on over into. There's the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints. All those things are coming as the harvest, and we'll cover those things as we come. But right now, we see that we are the first fruits of the harvest. Amen. We're going to get resurrected and live with Christ forever. The Bible says we'll never leave His side. We'll always be with Him, ever be with the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Amen. And all that came at Pentecost when the church began. And so we have that wonderful truth. We live in that wonderful day. Amen. The Bible says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. They're all one in Him. Amen. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, people are, Jewish people can be saved. We have uh, missionaries in Israel, which we ought to be, where I'm presently looking for a good one in Israel. We ought to uh, be supporting missionaries in Israel uh, that are trying to win those people to the Lord. There are people here on the, in the United, there are a lot of Jews here in the United States that need to be saved. And there are people that are evangelizing them and trying to get them saved. And so the, all those will be a part uh, of the church. But after the, after the resurrection, after the, after the rapture of the church, uh, those people will have to go through the tribulation period. There will be people saved in that time. Uh, I believe this. I believe most of those people saved in that time, the majority of the people saved in that time, will be Jewish. I think there, there are some Gentiles that will be saved. Uh, some Gentiles that have never heard the word of God and never heard uh, the gospel presented. But those of us who've heard the gospel, there's a, there's a lot of people in this country that have heard the gospel. Kids that have sat in church all their life, heard the gospel, never been saved. There's people that have heard the gospel and passed it over, just like I did for, for 29 years of my life. Passed it over. That had heard the gospel and knew the truth. That they can't be saved in the tribulation period. That's the truth. Second Thessalonians. 
Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that truth. And so if you're waiting on things to happen that way, you're waiting the wrong way. And so the time to be saved is now. The accepted time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Amen? We can spend all of our time arguing with the darkness, but what we ought to be doing is lighting a light for those that have never been saved because time is coming. I believe we're closer now than we've ever been uh, to Christ coming. I believe, it's, I believe it's imminent. I believe it can be any day that Christ could come. Amen? Aren't you glad for that wonderful truth that he came for the church, died and put us in the body of Christ that we could be with him forever? Amen? I'm thankful for that wonderful truth. Amen. Uh, let's all stand. I'll ask everybody to stand and ask Miss Hannah to come to the, song, to the piano. <coughs> and I agree with <coughs> Brother Daniel. It's good to have a piano player.